I launched my colorectal cancer video back in April of last year. There will be some concepts in here which can be further clarified if you go back and watch the original video. With that said, I recently decided to see what's been published on colorectal cancer in the microbiome in the past 10 months, and I found quite a bit. So this video is an update and reinforces my previous findings. So let's take a look at what my meta-analysis shows as a microbial fingerprint for colorectal cancer. Here we have the bad guys. When I compiled all the data from my meta-analysis and updated it with the new data in this video, I get this slide here. This microbial fingerprint of colorectal cancer is a unique one. Sure, we see here several of the usual suspects across all disease states, such as E. coli, Enterococcus, and Streptococcus. But the genus Fusobacterium is the clear number one suspect. And within this genus, the species F. nucleatum is highly suspect, but is certainly not alone. Additionally, the genus Porphyrmonis has the second most disease-associated data points with its species P. A. sacrolytica leading the way within the genus, etc. on down the chart. When I include all biopsy data I have, which is not reflected here, it only serves to bolster these findings. In other words, these same bacteria are not only in the lumen of the colon, but are also in the mucus layer and within the tumors themselves. More on this later. Many of these taxa are from the oral microbiome. I will reference back to these names as we proceed. To include the popular new probiotic, Amucinophila, which has all negative data here, and to be safe should not be taken if you have CRC concerns. And here is the microbial fingerprint for the health promoters who are most consistently significantly reduced in colorectal cancer. Again, we see many of the usual players. Carpococcus, E. halii, E. rectale, F. prosecii, Fusicatinibacter, Lachnospira, Roseberry, or Ruminococcus. Names which come up in all of my videos. If you're concerned about CRC, we need to boost the abundance of these health promoters, all of which, except for Bifidobacterium, are or contain butyrate producers. So now, with all of these names in mind, I know it's difficult, we'll look at the new data points and see if they corroborate these fingerprints for CRC. In our first of these studies, all of which are from 2024, the researchers compared the microbiomes of 26 advanced adenoma patients versus that of 26 controls. They used shotgun metagenomics to analyze the fecal microbiomes. And what did they find? Consistency in the data. That's what they found. In the controls, butyrate health promoters, I always mention F. prosecii, Roseburia, and Odoribacter, were significantly increased, while in CRC, the classic opportunistic pathogen E. coli was significantly increased. And we also see amusinophila, that's acromancy mucinophila, significantly increased in CRC once again here. They went on to say, quote, short chain fatty acid, i.e. butyrate, serves as beneficial agents in maintaining the gut homeostasis insufficiency of short-chain fatty acids would result in a pro-inflammatory microenvironment and lead to CRC progression. Likewise, in this paper, we may not see the exact same taxa, but we see the same theme. The healthy controls had significantly more lachnospira, buterosococcus, and ruminococcus, again, all butyrate-producing health promoters, while the fecal microbiomes of the CRC patients had significantly more agrothella, and enterococcus, classic opportunistic pathogens I mention all the time, plus two taxa from the oral microbiome, Parvomonas and Peptostreptococcus, part of the unique ID of the CRC microbiome. Additionally, once again, we see a mucinophila significantly higher in CRC versus healthy controls. And here we see more of the same. Again, more consistency. For the bad guys in turquoise, we once again see Porphyrmonas. We also see another component of the signature, Prevotella intermedia, which is in our profile from earlier. And there is a species from Fusobacterium, F. periodonticum. These are all oral pathogens. And again, in my original video, I talk more on that concept. 
For the good guys, we see significant reductions of multiple butyrate-producing health promoters. Again, the usual players. And the authors state, quote, microorganisms such as E. coli and Fusobacterium destroy the intestinal barrier lining and colonic cell DNA, increase pro-inflammatory cytokines and oxidation factors, and produce potential carcinogenic toxins, which may become an important target for CRC therapy. Their last part puzzles me a bit. What part is the CRC therapy? Why not be proactive and address the root cause and change the microbiome for the better? And avoid the pro-inflammatory DNA damaging environment altogether. I hope you're enjoying the video so far. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and recommend to friends and family. Also, if you're feeling extra generous, hit the super thanks below. And yet another paper, I know, a lot got published in less than a year, we see the same pattern. The beauty producers E. rectale and Buterosococcus are significantly reduced in their CRC microbiome, while we see two classic CRC arptisic pathogens, Parvomonas micra and Peptostreptococcus stomatis, significantly increased. Again, lots of consistency. This pattern is not a coincidence. And from our last new fecal microbiome paper, we see the same thing. Peptostreptococcus stomatis and species from Porphyrmonas significantly increased in the CRC microbiome, while the prolific butyrate producer E. rectale, listed here as Agathobacter, because it was recently classified into one species genus not long ago, is significantly decreased in those with CRC. So now, I'm not going to get into the benefits of butyrate. I talk about that all the time. We're going to spend just two slides looking inside the tumor and at the mechanism. Now, you have to realize that in a healthy microbiome, these bad actors either aren't present, or if they are, their numbers are small and their troublemaking ability is kept in check by a healthy microbiome. But when you've done harm to your microbiome via diet, antibiotics, PPIs, and more, then you create an environment where the bad guys are in charge. With that said, these researchers looked at 130 tissue samples from tumor and non-tumor sites. They found three species from Fusobacterium and one from Streptococcus, which were significantly higher in tumor tissue than non-tumor tissue. These aren't good bacteria. They are pro-inflammatory bad guys. And you can read to the left a couple of their quotes of how they talk about the secretion of pro-inflammatory mediators that can promote CRC. I talked about a couple of these mediators in the first video. But instead of focusing on the mediators, we'll look at the environment they create. In B, we see survivability graft. It shows that those patients who had a higher load of the number one culprit, F. nucleatum, in their tumor, along with a high level of DNA damage, hence mutation, had significantly worse survival. I think this is a concept easy to understand, although the specifics can be mind-boggling. We're talking about an arptisic pathogen driving inflammation in your cells via multiple mechanisms, and a possible outcome during this chronic inflammation is damage to the cell control center and mechanisms involved in keeping cells from doing things they should not be doing. And if you look at D, you can see some of this complexity play out. It's not important to understand what role each acronym listed here does exactly within the cell. Just to understand that there was an upregulation of 11 of these genes which are known to be involved in the DNA damage response or are recognized as oncogenes, a gene that causes cancer, highlighting their potential role in tumor genesis. And conversely, seven of these genes which were downregulated in samples with high levels of F nucleatum. These seven downregulated genes are reported to have functions related to DNA damage repair, suggesting that their downregulation could impair the cell's ability to repair DNA damage. 
thereby contributing to the progression of the disease. The good news is that although CRC affects so many people, only about 5% is genetic, which means most everyone can do something to improve their odds of avoiding it. In addition, it generally takes 5 to 10 years or longer for CRC to develop from a polyp. Beyond that, if you do a microbiome analysis, assuming the results are accurate, the report is thorough, and the person reading the report knows what they're doing, which are three big assumptions, then the microbial fingerprint is quite unique and could give you cause to take action before it's too late. But perhaps you should take action anyway, as legions of microbiomes have been negatively impacted by our lifestyle, hence the high rates of CRC, and the fact that it is growing in young adults. If you've somehow managed to avoid antibiotics, PPIs, stress, and a bad diet, then congratulations. But if you're like the people I work with in my consultations, life has done a number on your microbiome, whether we're talking about CRC or any other health concern, in which case it's probably time to take good care of your microbiome so we can, in turn, take good care of you. If you liked the video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, somewhere around here, you can go to my website where you can schedule a consultation with me. You can also view the protocols. And here, you can watch the next video.